Welcome to St. James, guys. Uh, glad to see you all here and glad to see, uh, why well, don't actually see them, but uh, people who are worshiping with us uh, via um, YouTube, glad that you're here with us as well. Uh, if you could take a minute and just look at the schedule for this week, there's not a lot of announcements, but uh, let me run over a couple of things real quick. Uh, guest books at the end of your aisle, if you could take those and fill those out and pass those down uh, to the people next to you, there's also a QR code to do attendance there in the bulletin if you want to do it that way. Uh, ministry fair last week, uh, it was really kind of nice. Uh, we'll build on what we kind of learned from that and uh, we'll do it again. There's still the sign-up sheets for those of you who uh, would like to figure out ways to get involved here, to participate. Remember, church is not like a spectator sport. It's not a Sunday morning event. It's a community of people uh, that love and serve each other and love and serve their community in the name of Jesus. And if you want to participate in that, uh, there are ways. You could do that on your own, of course, but it's better to do it in community. It's easier to do it in community. Um, if you don't want to participate in that, please come and talk to me because you, do, you should want to participate in that. Um, so those sign-up sheets are downstairs. There's like eight or nine different ministries led by different deacons and deaconesses uh, that you can sign up for. Um, one last thing is we're having a conversation with an architect uh, right now who is working on plans for adding on educational space and some other stuff that we need. And I just wanted to give you an update. I don't have anything to tell you right now, just for those of you who are, have been asking uh, where that's at. Um, we're going to get you uh, some more information about that here in the next month or so. We have a meeting this week with him. He's going to show us some preliminary drawings. And then we'll bring them to you guys, and then we can decide if we, if we want to do it or if we should do it or anything like that. So that's just a little update there. Uh, men's Bible study Tuesday morning. We're uh, working through the book of Proverbs. Uh, Saturday morning, women's Bible study. And then finally, the great divorce on Wednesday night. That happens on Zoom. If you want to participate in that, let me know. All right, I think that's all I have in terms of announcements or schedule. Let's go ahead and stand and we'll sing the opening hymn. Oh 
continue in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Let's confess our sin to God. Father, you are the Lord and you alone. You've made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that's on it, the seas and all that's in them, and you preserve them all. You have called us to yourself and given us a covenant. You have become our God and made us your people, and yet we have turned away from you. We have rebelled against you. You have delivered us many times according to your covenant mercies. You have warned us, and yet we have acted presumptuously. You have sent us prophets, and we have turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened our necks and would not obey your law. You are the Lord and you alone. You are our God, great and mighty. You keep covenant and steadfast love. We deplore our sins before you and before each other. They've only gotten us into trouble. They have only enslaved us. They have not given us the happiness they promised. Deliver us from our sin and the power and attraction of sin through the faithful suffering and death of our Savior Jesus Christ, whose intercession we plead and whose name we pray. Amen. Upon this, your confession, I announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Savior Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's read Psalm 92 together. Just a reminder, Psalm 92, uh, the heading doesn't show up here in the reading, but Psalm 92 is a psalm for the Sabbath. It's good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. The stupid man cannot know. The fool cannot understand this. That though the wicked sprout like grass and all evildoers flourish, They are doomed to destruction forever. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish. All evildoers shall be scattered. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. You have poured over me fresh oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. The righteous flourish like the palm tree, and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
may be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Deuteronomy 5. It's from the Ten Commandments that are recorded, uh, not in Exodus 20, but in Deuteronomy 5. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, The epistle reading is from Hebrews chapter 3. Um, The writer of Hebrews, it's a sermon, actually is telling his congregation uh, that if they abandon Christ and go back to temple worship, uh, that they're going to miss out on um, eternal life. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, he's quoting a psalm here, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I sworn my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we share in Christ indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Wasn't it all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Wasn't it with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, 
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 11. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what it's not lawful to do on the Sabbath. So, so technically they were farming. They were you know, plucking heads of grain, which, is, uh, um, uh, which uh, the Mishnah tells us is a violation of the Sabbath command. Don't do any work. Jesus said to them, though, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priest? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath, because they have to work on the Sabbath, and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Can you look back in your bulletin at the Old Testament reading, Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15? I want to look at that for a few minutes with you guys. This is a few, a couple weeks ago, we had a, a we celebrated Ascension last week, but a couple weeks ago we talked about Sabbath, and we talked about the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, and we talked about how what God says to his people about Sabbath there is rooted in creation. You guys are going to work for six days, and on the seventh day, you're going to rest because God worked for six days making the world, and on the seventh day, he rested and enjoyed what he had done, and um, so you're going to look like that. You're going to look like God. God works. God rests. There's this rhythm of working and then enjoying what you've done uh, by resting in it, and, and you guys are going to do the same thing, but when you get to the record of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5, it's a little bit of a different theme to it. Creation isn't mentioned here. Instead, something else is mentioned. Let me read this to you again. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a the mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Here, the focus isn't on creation. The focus is on redemption from slavery. Real quick primer for those of you who don't know or have forgotten the story. Israel is a tiny, minority, oppressed ethnic group in the land of Egypt. God liberates them with a bunch of miracles. He flexes his muscles. He shows off. He shows off how, more, how much more powerful he is than the Egyptian gods. They're liberated across the Red Sea. There's the whole Passover uh, incident and the, 
They're liberated across the Red Sea and they become a free people. And God says, well, while they're in the wilderness, I want you to observe Sabbath because I want you to remember that you used to be slaves and that I redeemed you. I bought you out of this. Redeemed just means to buy back. I bought you out of the slave market and now you're, now you're slaves anymore. So the focus in this text is on redemption. And so let's look at these three verses and talk about redemption for a few minutes. What we're redeemed from, who we're redeemed to, and what we're redeemed for. Who we're, what we're redeemed from, who we're redeemed to, and what we're redeemed for. So first of all, what are we redeemed from? And the answer is uh, just slavery, right? Verse 15 says, you shall remember that you were, past tense, you were a slave in the land of Egypt. What does that mean that they were slaves? What was, their, what was their life like when that was who they were, when that was their identity? Well, I'll give you some examples. I'm gonna read a bunch of pull quotes from Exodus chapter five right here. So one of the times when, Mo, when Moses goes to Egypt and he meets with Pharaoh and he says, hey, listen, this is wrong. You need to let my people go so they can go in the wilderness and worship Yahweh. And um, uh, Pharaoh says to him in verse four, why are you taking the people away from their work? Get back to your labors. Verse five, he says, you just want them to stop working, Pharaoh says in verse five. Verses seven through eight, he says, I'm done. You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves, but you shall require of them the same quantity of bricks as they have made previously. Do not diminish it because they're lazy. It's gonna be a theme that keeps on popping back up over and over with Pharaoh is, you guys are just lazy. This whole religion stuff, it's just, an excuse for your own laziness. Verse nine, Pharaoh says, let heavier work be laid on them. Then they will labor at it and pay no attention to deceptive words. Verses 10 and 11, Pharaoh repeats, I will not give you straw. Go and get straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be lessened in the least. Verse 13, he says, complete your work. The same daily assignment as when you were given straw. Verse 14, why didn't you finish the required quantity of bricks yesterday and today as you did before? Verses 16 through 19. Moses comes, actually it's the, it's, the, it's the Hebrew foreman who come to Pharaoh and say, why do you treat your slaves like this? No straw is given to your slaves, yet they say to us, make bricks. Pharaoh says to the foreman, you're lazy. Lazy, he repeats. That's why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. For no straw will be given you, but you shall still deliver the same number of bricks. You shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. This is what it means to be a slave. Your identity is you produce, you make, you work to bolster Pharaoh's system. Pharaoh wants to make money. Pharaoh wants to store grain. Pharaoh wants to be the Lord of Egypt. And it's your job as slaves to just do the work you're lazy. That's your problem. The fall is you're lazy. Redemption is you need to work harder and harder. The problem is you're lazy. You need to work. That's what it means to be a slave. When your identity becomes you're a producer. That's what a slave is. Who are you? You're somebody who produces. That's what a slave is. It's the same way for us too. There's this uh, essay a couple days ago in uh, the online uh, magazine Unheard a guy by the name of, is a British thinker and writer by the name of Paul, Paul Kingsnorth, Paul Kingsnorth, who is, um, he's written about uh, environmental things and economic things for the past 20 years. And interestingly enough, he's a really good writer, but interestingly enough, he just actually just became a Christian last year. He's just baptized into the Christian church last year. He wrote this essay, which two days ago was published on Unheard, and the name of the essay was, The Antichrist Now Rules Us All. And the subtitle is this, the age of progress has turned everything into machines and money. And what he argues in this essay is absent God, absent, tra absent transcendent value, all there is left is progress. And by progress, he means technological advances, things that help us work better. Hard work, materialism, the carrot of money and property to get us to work more and more and more and more to keep on bolstering the system, which has to grow or it dies. If there's no God, then progress is all that, there, that, all that exists, he says. And in the middle of this, he quotes um, Allen Ginsberg's poem, how some of you boomers who were like rebellious kids back in the 60s will remember the beat poet Allen Ginsberg and his famous poem, how, and I'm gonna quote a little bit to you from what uh, Kingsnorth quotes in this, um, 
in this essay. And I suggest too, like, go, go and read the essay on your own. It's pretty interesting. But he quotes from Allen Ginsberg's poem, How. And Allen Ginsberg is also judging this, the fact that in, in contemporary Western materialistic society, we've, we've been reduced to producers. We're producers. That's all we are. And he says this. This is a little bit from this, this crazy beat poem. And it references a, 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 a God by the name of Moloch. And some of you who know the Old Testament will know that Moloch was an ancient, was an ancient Phoenician deity who could only be satisfied with the death of babies. That was the only thing that would slake his desire for justice and for blood was if you offered up your infant to him. And we, we know from uh, our archaeology and from some historical records that um, Moloch would be represented by a big, hollow, metal idol with outstretched hands. And a large fire would be stoked inside this idol until the metal burnt, like got, got searing hot. And then people's children would be taken and placed in the hands to die, like being burned to death in this hot metal. Allen Ginsberg is referencing this God. So, so you see what he's saying here. He's saying that the Moloch of this age is consumer culture. It's the... The, 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 the money-making world which says, I won't be satisfied until I have your flesh, producers of the world, workers of the world. He's, here's, what, here's what Allen Ginsberg says. Moloch, whose mind is pure machinery. Moloch, whose blood is running money. Moloch, whose fingers are ten armies. He's, he's referencing the fact that in, in order to, 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 to make and maintain money, in order to acquire and protect valuable natural resources. It takes large armies in order to do this. Moloch, whose fingers are ten armies. Moloch, whose love is endless oil and stone. Moloch, whose soul is electricity and banks. I don't think fundamentally that we're much different when we allow ourselves to be. We're much different than the Hebrew slaves. Our identity becomes producers. In fact, this is kind of a, a, a truism at this point, is if you ask 99 out of 100 Americans, tell me about yourself, they'll, they'll automatically tell you what their job is for, first. They will instantly tell you how they contribute to society economically. We've become slaves. We've become people whose identity is worker, producer. Examples of how this pressure works on us, sometimes in unseen ways, sometimes in ways that we can hardly even think about. But we just sort of accept now because it's, it's, it's the story that we get told, it's the story that we tell ourselves, that this is where we get our value is by making bricks. Advertising is, a one, is one big one. Advertising, again, this is sort of a truism. We're all sort of aware of this. The, advertise, uh, the, the job of advertising is to convince you that the product or the service being sold is necessary for your happiness or for your completion or for your sense of satisfaction or for your safety or for your well-being or for your mental health or whatever it is. You must have this product or service. Well, of course, to get that product or service, you're going to have to spend money, else it wouldn't be worthwhile advertising. How do you get money? You go to work to create products and services, which your company is going to advertise to convince other consumers that they need in order to be happy or satisfied or mentally healthy or secure or whatever it is. And so the cycle continues, and the money continues to be made, and we all spend lots of times trying to convince each other that what I produce is necessary for you to buy, and you convince me that what you produce is necessary for me to buy, and we become into, we, we were turned into combination producers, consumers. We've become slaves. Academics is the same way. Academics feeds right into this. Had a conversation at the high school's um, uh, board meeting just this past week on Thursday, Thursday evening about the rise of cheating in all schools, in ours, and, and our principal brought up this uh, recent massive scandal in the largest, wealthiest private school in Phoenix, where um, very, very upper, uh, uh, upper middle class, upper class school, where there's, it just got exposed within the past couple of weeks, this vast cheating network where students were able to tap in. There's a system built where they could tap into college students from the local college to get papers. And even, I, I don't, this is what I heard, I don't even know how this would work, but even get the SAT and ACT taken for them by college students. Now, now why is that? Why are our kids so desperate to cheat in school? Well, you know why. Because school isn't about the humanities anymore. It's not about becoming a more well-rounded person. It's about making money. 
In fact, our teachers, and there's a lot of teachers in the room right now, you could ask them, and conversations with students are a dime a dozen, where a student will say, well, what use is this class to me? What, what, how am I ever going to use this? What do they mean by that? How is algebra going to make me money someday? That's what they mean. What's the assumption? And, and lots of teachers will be like, well, like, maybe someday you're going to need this in your job. Like, you just kind of feed into it. Like, you have to defend yourself. Like, what I'm teaching you, no, no, seriously, I promise, what I'm teaching you will make you money someday. But it's this whole, like, it's, it's this shared narrative where school exists in order to turn you into a producer or a consumer. That, that's what, this, is, this is what academics has degenerated into in our consumerist culture. One more, a quick one, then we'll move on to the next point. People who aren't producers are less valuable than people who are. This is just, I, I'm, not, I'm, not even, I'm not even gonna try to defend this. So just on the face of it, I think this is just true. The unborn, the unborn prisoners, the elderly, the homeless, people with mental challenges, these people are less valuable. They don't produce. And so those people or their caretakers or defenders have to defend why they should be allowed to exist because they don't produce. And so there has to be some sort of larger argument. And all the arguments that say, well, maybe they will produce someday. Well, they actually can produce a little bit or they used to produce. So with the elderly, it's, well, if they worked hard enough to save up for a retirement, then we understand that, you know. We, we, the people who are at Meridian Village, we understand that. The people that are troubling to us are the elderly that don't have any more money and are a burden to their families or to the state. These people don't produce anymore or can't produce, and so they become less valuable. Just like in any sort of slave system, those that can't produce or won't produce are tossed aside. They have no value to the system. And we all sort of capitulate into this because we are all, by nature, slaves to any sort of system. And when God redeems the people of Israel out of Egypt, what he's saying is, is you are no longer slaves. That's not your identity anymore. Your identity is no longer producer. You are now my child. And so you're going to celebrate Sabbath as an embodied sign that that's not who you are anymore. You're not a slave. Well, this brings us to who we're redeemed to. We're redeemed from slavery. Who are we redeemed to? We're redeemed to God himself. Verse 14, beginning part of verse 14. The, the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. First of all, Sabbath is God's Sabbath. It belongs to him. He's the, he celebrated the first Sabbath. It's his. And because of that, look down at verse 15, the back half of verse 15. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Because it's the Lord our God's Sabbath, and because we're his people, he gives us the Sabbath too. And because he knows it's going to be a challenge, he knows that we're always going to want to fall back into that old identity of produce. That's how I get my value. If I'm not making things, if I'm not doing good things, if I'm not a good parent, if I'm not making great art, if I'm not up for the next promotion, if, if people look at me and think, oh, he's lazy, if I'm not getting good grades, then I don't have value because God knows we're always going to fall back into that system. He commands us to celebrate Sabbath as a constant reminder that that's not who you are. You're not a grade earner anymore. You're not a producer anymore. It's not your job to create services for people anymore. You've been liberated from that sort of slavery. More on work just in a minute in case anybody thinks I'm sneaking laziness in the back door. We'll get back to that later. Somebody might say at this point, those of you who are good, 21st century Christians might say at this point, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. Why are you bringing work into this? I've never heard. I've never heard the Ten Commandments talked about or the Exodus talked about and somebody talk about my job or my role. What, isn't all of that, you know, the Exodus and the Passover, isn't all of that a metaphor for like redemption from sin? Like the slavery that we have to sin and God's redeemed us from that. This, I don't really think this, it might, maybe it's about their work, but that's not really, it's not really about our work. Well, let me just say, first of all, Please try not to be comfortable with this. Like the entire system would like you to believe that Christianity has nothing really to do with your outside life. You, you guys can go once a week to this little building and sit there in the orange pews and have your little spiritual service. But when you get out into the real world, it's time to get back to work. It's time to contribute to this system. It's time to make some money for the man. It's time to work hard, even if it's your own business. It's time, that's who, that's who you're going to be. 
And what God wants you to say is that that's not the case. There's always a temptation to divide. So don't, don't, don't allow, don't allow the world to divide your life up like that, where you have a spiritual life, where you have redemption from slavery, but really in your, your Monday through Friday life, you're still a slave. I was at, um, Kate played, my daughter Kate played at a, um, a band festival up in Champaign last week, and uh, it was really, really good. And one of the songs that the, that the band played was, um, it was, it was a new arrangement of the, um, uh, the, the, the antebellum slave spiritual wade in the water. And it was really, really uh, fantastic piece. But they had different kids from the band uh, get up and talk about like, what does this piece mean and everything beforehand, which is really kind of helpful when you're listening to music that doesn't have any words to get kind of s- s- some sort of context to it. But I, and I quickly, I pulled out my phone and like typed this down as the kid was saying, because I thought this was, I was going to share this with you guys in the sermon. Uh, one of the, and, the, and the kid was just reading off the, the material that the, whoever the, the, the director of the program had given him. But explaining Wade in the Water, the kid said this, while African-American spirituals flow out of deeply held religious beliefs, they also reflect a desire for freedom from slavery. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to pay attention. All right, for, for those of you who are like in the 300 level here, like tr- try and figure out what's wrong with this sentence. It's, it's, it's not horror. It's not, it's not evil or anything. But like, what's the problem with this sentence? I'm going to say it again. While African-American spirituals flow out of deeply held religious beliefs, they also reflect a desire for freedom from slavery. What's wrong with that? Here's what's wrong with it. Should, should I give you some time to think? So you can feel good about it if you get the right answer. What's wrong with it is that there's a disjunct between the African-American slaves' spiritual beliefs and their desire from slavery. It's like, there's, it's two separate things. Like over here on the religious part of their brains, the African-American slaves loved Jesus. They were very spiritual. But over here on the real world part of their brains, they wanted freedom from slavery and what, what's going on here in the book of Exodus and what's, what God is calling you this morning in your own life to understand is, is those two things go together. If God has redeemed you from slavery, that means that you can be redeemed from slavery. That means that you are no longer a slave to your job. You're no longer a slave to your boss. You're no longer a slave to a system which says you have value if you make money. And when you stop making money, you don't have worth. I've told you guys before that I'm not preaching at you guys. I'm preaching to myself too. I've told you guys before, I've gotten fired from a job. I've gotten fired from a church. And it absolutely crushed me. You know why? Because my identity was not lover of Jesus. It wasn't baptized child of God. It wasn't servant to God's people. It was, I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor. And when that was gone, I was crushed. I still find the same thing going on, even though I've got this job here. So two different conversations. So I'll I'll be in a conversation with one group of people, okay? And this is a group of people who maybe not church people. And they'll say, so this happens sometimes. I would go to work parties with Angela when she worked at the Business Journal. And uh, people would say, oh, what do you do? And I'd be like, "Um, I'm a pastor. Fingers crossed they don't like roll their eyes and walk away. And usually it was just a conversation killer. Oh, that's interesting. You know, that's usually what, like, do, do you think I'm evil? Or like, are you really weird? You know, uh, it, it was usually like that. Now, why was, I, why, why was I so weird about telling people like that that I'm a pastor? Here's why. is because in their mind, I know that they think I don't produce anything. This guy's kind of useless, you know. He's kind of a relic. You know, it's like a town crier or, you know, somebody who, uh, I don't know, somebody who, who, who makes horse saddles for a living. Like, it's like this, this museum piece here. He doesn't really produce anything. I guess there's some weirdos who kind of like to have a pastor around. But really, he doesn't really produce anything. So I always felt weird about this. But like in Christian circles, like if people say, what do you do? I say, I'm a pastor. Because they value what I do. Like for them, I do do good things. Now, what, 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 what am I falling into? I'm falling into this mindset that I am production. Even as a pastor, it's my job to serve and to produce healthy Christians or to produce three-star sermons. I was going to uh, rate it up higher, but it's kind of low bar here. 
produce like sermons or whatever, you know, Bible studies to uh, visit, show up at the hospital when you're sick. That's my job. And if I can do that, I have value. But there are other people who are like, sermons, who the heck cares? Then I feel, then I feel weird about it because I'm not, I'm not producing. But God comes to redeem me back to himself and say, Aaron, you're not a producer anymore. It's not who your identity is. You no longer need to make sermons to make people happy. You no longer need to make money to make people happy. You no longer need to produce a product to make people happy because you have been redeemed to God. There's a sermon, sermon. Actually, that's it's a, it's a very excellent Freudian slip. There was an advertisement that I remember from, um, it was like 15 years ago. Um, uh, Anheuser-Busch did a series of Bush beer commercials and uh, they all had this same Leonard Skinner song, A Simple Kind of Man, as like the soundtrack behind it. But I remember this one and, and, and the voiceover was, it, so it was, it's, this is a part of the Head for the Mountains campaign. You remember, you remember that? Like in the 70s, it was like cowboys rope and stuff. And then like, like in the 90s, and, and even now that campaign's still going on. It's almost 40 years old. In, in the 90s, it's like it's about outdoor sports now. You know, people are kayaking or climbing a mountain. And the voiceover of this one commercial um, is from uh, 16 years ago. I remember because the Cardinals were in the playoffs in 2004 when I first heard it. A bonus, that was nothing to do with the sermon. Uh, the voiceover was, out here, nobody owns you. They all started with, out here. And then they, they would go on to say something. Out here, nobody owns you. Your job doesn't own you. Your boss doesn't own you. Out here, nobody owns you but you. Bush. That was the commercial. And I thought, oh, they've got, they, they, they've got the diagnosis right. What they understand is that the system wants to own us. Now, the solution is wrong. Like saying, the system's not going to own me. I'm going to own myself. I'm going to make my own money. Okay, you're just a part of the system. Like, you're just like, you're a slave to whatever it is that you've decided to do to make yourself money or whatever it is, you know. The solution is we need to be bought back by God. We need to be redeemed by God. And so here's what's interesting about God. Think about the slave world. It could be, it could be, it could be an ancient Roman slave market in the city of some, in, in some city in Gaul. It could, be, uh, the, it could be a slave market in Memphis, Tennessee in 1843. It could be a slave market in Bangkok, Thailand, where girls are trotted out to be purchased uh, as, as a part of the sex tourism industry. In any one of those, when somebody comes along and says, I'm going to buy that one, do you think that's a good feeling for the person who's being bought? Absolutely not. You know that when you're being purchased, you're being transferred from one version of slavery to another. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of our story, comes a God who says, I'm buying that one. And when you show up for service, he says, I don't need your service. I just want you. I don't want slaves. I want kids. That's who we need to be redeemed by. Somebody who liberates for us from a system which says you only have value to the extent that you can produce something. Well, what are we redeemed for? If we're redeemed to God, if we're redeemed from slavery, what are we redeemed for? Verse 14 says it. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or any of these people, we are redeemed for Sabbath rest. God has rescued us so that we no longer have to be identified with our work, that we can be identified as his people, free and easy, as daughters and sons of the king, no longer slaves. The gospel reading, if you can look over at that with me, Jesus summarizes this completely. In the second story, starting with Matthew 12, verse one, and I don't have time to unpack all of this because there's a ton here. The religious people in the story have got it in their heads that Sabbath is another way to work. Sabbath is actually another way to produce, to show God that you're faithful or whatever it is. And Jesus says that's actually not the way it's going to work. In chapter 12, verse 7, he says this, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. God desires mercy, not sacrifice. What, what, is it, what, what does it mean, I desire mercy? Where does mercy come from? Mercy is not demanding from people, not giving to people punishment they deserve. That's God's heart. God longs to say, you've been a worker. Maybe that's what you deserve. Your heart longs to become a producer so that you can identify with something that you've done. But I'm gonna take that away from you. I'm gonna mercifully, mercifully take that away from you. I don't want sacrifice anymore. I don't want work anymore. I don't need you to slave for me. I don't need you to sacrifice your life. In fact, this is, the, this is I say this in here quite often. Christianity is the only worldview in the world that says you don't have to sacrifice to be on the end. 
Every other worldview does. Every other religion does. Every economic system says, in order to get on the end, you have to do something. You have to be something. You have to produce something. Christianity is the only one that says, I'm going to do it all for you. I don't need you to do anything. I don't need you to sacrifice. I just want to give you mercy. It's perfectly expressed by Jesus up in the, of course, up in the, uh, the, the first three verses of that gospel reading. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you Sabbath. Actually, the Greek word there is actually just a word that you could just translate Sabbath if you'd like. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you Sabbath. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find Sabbath for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus comes and give us, gives us Sabbath rest because the only thing worth working for in the entire world is eternal life, and he's already done all the work. Jesus comes here and does every single, this, so this is why this is so important, okay? This is the payout of the sermon here. Give me five more minutes, maybe even less than that, and I'll tell you why this is so important. Because when you identify with your job, because when you say, I have value because I serve these people, or when I have value because I produce this, what you're doing is a form of works justification. What we do, when, I, when, I'm, when as a pastor, when I say my value is my sermons, or my Bible studies, or my counseling, or whatever, or my visits, what I'm doing is saying, I have value because something of, that I do, that I produce. That's works justification. That cuts right at the heart of the gospel. And the heart of the gospel that, that cuts into is the promise that Jesus has already done all the work. God became flesh. Jesus came here so that he could do all the work for us. So that he could die on the cross and do all the work of paying for all the sins and do all the work of getting rid of all Get, get, getting rid of all the slave systems in the entire world. He did all that work. He rose from the dead so that you and I would not have to do any work at all. Now, one more thing and I'll be done. What does this mean for work? Like I said earlier, I'm not, this is not like an advocating for laziness. What it does is transform work. Look, if your work becomes something that you don't have to do to bolster your own identity, that you are liberated to serve and love each other. Now, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say this in 30 seconds, but there, it needs more. So I'm gonna encourage you, I've never done this in a sermon before and it feels a little bit self-gratifying to me, but I'm gonna do it. Now, Chuck and I recorded a podcast. It's the last one that dropped last week and it's on work. And the reason why it's on work is because I've been studying Sabbath. And so I kind of double dip sometimes. So I don't have to st study uh, a couple of things. There's some stuff that I wanted to say that I wasn't gonna say in the sermon. And basically what I wanna argue that in there is this is if I don't have to work, if I don't have to be a slave to you guys, or to my bosses, or to a capitalist system, then that liberates me to love and serve you guys and expect nothing in return. Look, why, in our system, there are two reasons why you have the job that you have. Because it makes you happy, or it makes you money. And the lucky ones we feel like are the ones that it does both. But a lot of you stress out because your job doesn't make you money. And maybe it makes you happy, but even then you feel a little bit bummed about the fact that you're poor and you wish it. Some of you have worked at jobs where you're not happy, but it makes you good money. And you're stressed out too. And what I'm saying is, is that the gospel is going to liberate you to just ditch that question altogether and to realize that the jobs that you do, not just, not, 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 not at this point, I'm not just talking about the money-making jobs you do, but the, the job of being a good friend, the job of being a boyfriend or a girlfriend, the job of being a spouse, the job of being a child or a parent or a next door neighbor or a co-worker, all those jobs, if you don't have to produce, then you get to produce. If you don't have to serve, you get to serve. And it doesn't matter what people think because you're doing it in the name of Jesus because you're filled up with the gospel and the one who's already done all the work lives in you and is at work through you and you can love and serve in his name. The system will not own you if you don't care what the system thinks. If you say to the system, I don't need you to make me happy and I don't need you to make me money, God will provide, then you will be free indeed. That's what Jesus came and died for. Not to get you to heaven when you die. It didn't happen in the Exodus. God didn't come and say, well, you're slaves. Dang it, sorry about that. But someday, if you believe in me, you'll die and go to heaven. No, Jesus said, I've come here to give you life and to give you life abundantly. I've come here so that you who come to me will no longer labor, but you can have rest. Because Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. Amen.
stand for prayer. Father, thank you for loving us and for being a good God. Thank you for being uh, a master who desires not slaves, but daughters and sons. Father, give us the rest that you've offered us in the gospel. Help us not to identify ourselves with what we do. Help us to identify ourselves with what your son has done for us on the cross from the empty tomb. Give us the Sabbath rest that you've created for us. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we want to all together now this morning, we want to pray for all those who are struggling with uh, sickness, uh, with physical sickness and brokenness, with uh, mental, struggle, mental health issues, with um, relationship struggles, people who are worried uh, about finances and jobs, people who are um, just generally anxious. Father, would you bless all of us who are, you know, every single one of us in here is struggling with some concern or other. Father, would you bless us with the healing of your son's resurrection? We pray especially this morning for Brandy Womack, who is a um, good friend of Shayla Walsh, who uh, has a brain tumor. Would you give her healing? Would you be with all those who are sick with COVID now? Would you pour healing and strength and energy into their bodies? Father, we, we, ask, you to, we ask you to answer these prayers. We know that you will either now or when your son returns to make all things new. We leave that up to your good and gracious will, Father. But we trust you for that. We trust that the resurrection of your son, Jesus, is powerful to make all things new. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you on this Memorial Day for all those who have given their lives to defend our country. We pray that you would bless the memory of them, that you would bless their families. We pray that you would bless our country with justice and righteousness and truth. Be with all of, our, all of us who are citizens here. We pray especially this morning that you be with our political leaders. Move their hearts, shape their hearts to be people of righteousness and honesty and selflessness, serving those whom they represent, that you would make them committed to principles of righteousness and justice and truth. Lord, in your mercy. We pray especially, Father, this morning for all those who are mourning um, the loss of the 19 people in the school shooting in Texas, which, which is all of us. And Father, we pray that you would do some sort of miraculous work in our culture, which has turned against you, has abandoned the realities of truth and righteousness. And now, Father, it looks like we're left with nothing but our power, our own power. And so we've sown the wind and we're reaping the whirlwind. And Father, I just pray that you would turn our hearts back to you I pray that you would allow us to give up pretenses of power, especially, Father, those who are especially evil. Would you put a stop to these people who are, for no reason at all, except for acts of power, killing the innocent, whatever that means. Father, please put a stop to it. Take care of and protect the life which you've created in your image. Father, do some sort of miraculous work. May the lordship of your son, Jesus Christ, come to bear on our culture in every aspect. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who did all the work for us, who worked so that we wouldn't have to work, who became a slave so that we could be free daughters and sons of you. And so we come into your throne room, and we're all screwed up, and we're all broken, and you know that. We all have bad motives, and we all have stuff that we're struggling with. And yet you insist on inviting us up onto your lap to pray these prayers to you. And so with nothing but gratefulness and praise and, and F Father, humility, because we know we don't deserve to be here, we pray all these prayers in the name of your Son, our brother, Jesus. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you've had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But mainly we're bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, for he is the true Passover Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world who by his death has destroyed death and by his rising to life again has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name 
evermore praising you and singing. pray in Jesus' name the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're about to celebrate Holy Communion. If you're visiting and you have any question at all about what's going on here or if you should participate, check out the, uh, the statement that we have in the front of the bulletin, which basically just explains basic Christian beliefs and what we believe here too. And if that's something that you're on board with, you're more than welcome to come forward and take communion. If not, or if you have questions, like totally come and talk to me. I love conversations like that. All right, let's begin. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Please stand. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you and keep you in the one true faith to life everlasting. Depart in Christ's peace. Amen. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Look around and find somebody you don't recognize or haven't talked to in a while. Start working on that relationship. Go in peace.